everybody doing? Good. Kind of lopsided today. That's okay. I'm going to work with it. All right. Uh, God is so good and so mighty. And sometimes I think I say it every week that I just like to sit there another half hour and keep worshiping, worshiping him. So I think one of these days we're going to have like a five-hour worship day or something where we all just sing praises to him for how good he is. I think this is a time of of real reflection in all of our lives. If you're not reflecting in your life right now, this is a good time to stop and see why the Lord is slowing us down. Right? Like you said, why the Lord is slowing us down. Because we just don't want to go digging. At least I always want to go digging for the Lord and see what I can do today to make an impact in the kingdom of God. And sometimes we just have to sit in our rest and learn to trust in Him in all we do. And so I was uh, reading through my prayer book this morning and... Uh, the Lord put the Shema on my heart, and so here it is. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Blessed be his name, whose glorious kingdom is forever and ever. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Baruch Shem Kavod Machos Adelam Vayed. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command you shall be upon your heart. And you shall teach them diligently unto your children. You shall talk about them when you sit in thine house, and when they walk about the way, and when they lie down, and when they rise up. And thou shalt bind them as a sign on your hands, and they shall for be on the frontals between thy eyes, and you shall write them upon the doorpost of the house and upon thy gates. Then it shall come about when the Lord your God brings you into the land which he swore to your fathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give you great and splendid cities which you did not build. And so are we letting the Lord build our cities today? Right? He's given us a great land, a great families. Right? We're here as small families today. But do we let him build our land? Do we let him build his kingdom in our hearts? And so that's what we're going to look at. We're in a sermon series called Backstory. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. And so we started off in the garden with the fall. And we've been working our way all the way through. And today we're looking at one of my favorite guys in Scripture. I probably say that every week because all, all eight of these guys are really powerful representations of God's mighty work in our lives. And uh, it wasn't them that did the work. It was God that did the work in them. And so as we learn to look at that, if you guys are looking for a smaller picture, a smaller picture I keep trying to want to shrink this every week. To force you guys to open up your Bibles. So if you have a Bible, it's Luke 3, 23 through 38. You should really get familiar with this lineage of Christ. It is his backstory. And so I encourage people to get their Bibles out, get a journal out, something to make notes with. And uh, we are going to really dig into some cool stuff today because we started off looking at Seth out of the garden, this third son of Adam and Eve. And we've continued to look at this theme of three sons which if you need things to hold it on together, because sometimes that helps me to have little themes in my mind, we're going to look at another set of three sons today. But first, we are moving to look at Abraham, because that's kind of where we ended off last week. In your seed, all the nations and the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. And so we have Father Abraham then went on from Father Abraham um, to Ishmael, Isaac, and Rubicah. And so that's kind of that family line. And today we're following through to Jacob, right? From Jacob um, into Judah. Jacob and Leah into Judah. And we're going to spend most of our time looking at the family of Judah today because that's a real important family. And that's the family line that Perez comes out of. And it's also the family line that our King and Lord and Savior is part of. And so if you've ever wondered... What tribe of the 12 tribes you're part of? If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're part of the tribe of Judah. And so it's really simple. It's not as complicated as people make it. I grew up in a Jewish home, and people always ask me what tribe I came out of. And I'm always like, Judah. Judah. And if you're not claiming Judah, you need to claim Judah. Let me tell you why. So we are looking at um, Perez today. Uh, Peretz. If you think of it in Hebrew, that's kind of how it's pronounced, Peretz, but we put a Z on it because we don't really end in many things. We don't know what to do with that Yud there. 
So there's a P, an R, and a Y. If you look at the Hebrew, that Y is called a Yud, a Yatz, right, which is Peretz. And it's very typical to a Yud, right? But there's a little bit of difference, and that's the difference in the sound they make on the end. And so the Yud is a, a symbol of God. And so this is not the exact symbol of God. That's the little tag, but... You say it basically the same thing, and it only shows up in a few places, which is really impressive that it shows up here. And we won't get into that because that's a message all on its own. So we're moving forward. Perez was one of the sons of Judah. Through an illicit affair with his daughter-in-law Tamar, Perez's twin brother was Zeriah. And in the biblical genealogies, Perez is listed as an ancestor of King David and of Jesus Christ. And so we have this guy that we're looking at that came out of an affair. A lot of us like to call it an illicit affair, okay? But really, we have one of our patriarchs um, out seeking a prostitute. And so we need to own that. It's part of our heritage. It's part of our tradition. It's part of where we are. The name Perez in Hebrews means to breach or he who bursts forth. And it refers to how he was born. And so I'm just kind of planning some thoughts that I want us to look at along the way here today. And then we're going to kind of loop back around and dig into them deeper. But this is the seed, right? Here's our seed verse in Genesis 3.15. So this is a major seed in the line that we're going to follow. But when Perez came about, what he did is he started a new process. He started a process of righteous men across the nation of Israel. And this is the first time since the beginning of, of pretty much Adam and Eve that we actually see a line of righteous people starting to form out of this. Because up until this point, we went from Adam and Eve, we went to the flood. We know during the flood that God spared Noah and his family, uh, but they struggled coming right off, right off the ark, like we talked about last week. And so we don't really have a righteous line until we get to Perez, and that's kind of a powerful thought. So let's get a backdrop on this story. So Judah, one of Jacob's 12 sons, so that's the 12 tribes of Israel, was leader of the Israelite tribe beginning with his name. And so most of us are okay with that idea. His sons were Ur, Onan, and Shelah. And so these are the three sons that we're going to look at today. Um, disobedient sons. And so that's one of the things that we sit there and we go, wow, this guy was, you know, Judah. And he was so bold, but he had disobedient sons. And we're going to look at maybe why that he had disobedient sons. Because ultimately... As parents, we do our best to raise our kids, but ultimately it, our kids have to see. They have to see God live. And I'm always telling parents this. We can set up boundaries for our kids. We can instruct our kids, but nobody's a second-generation Christian. We all have to stop and accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Savior on our own. So if you think you're putting up boundaries for your kids to try and create Christian kids, are those who follow God? Well, here's the boundary you would want to put up, which is this. Monkey see, monkey do. And that's kind of a hard one for us. Monkey see, monkey do. And so I often have parents standing in front of me, and they're outlining 20 years of youth ministry. They're outlining all the things that they're doing to make sure their kids are protected. I'm like, well, that's wonderful and all, but how about this? Do they see you at home reading your Bible? Do they see you at home praying? What is it you're actually trying to get them to do? Because what they're most likely going to do is copy you. And so we have to really take that to heart. And one of the reasons these three sons fell is I think although their father was claiming, he wasn't modeling. And so modeling is so important. So... Judah arranged for the marriage of his eldest son, Er, with a Canaanite woman named Tamar. So we're looking at the Canaanites again, which is, if those wonder how Jew your people got put into the Jewish community over and over, they were marrying people outside of their community and then bringing them in. And so it's very common, which is fine. But Er, who was wicked in the sight of the Lord, died before producing an offspring, leaving Tamar a childless, and wid widowless, a childless widow. And you can see that in Genesis 3, 8 through 7. And so, wicked in the eyes of the Lord, and he died. Well, monkey see, monkey do. Judah is probably one of the most wicked and hardest people in all of Scripture. And it's important that we need to recognize that. At least he has one of the most 
disturbing so stories considering he was a head of the tribe of Israel. He was actually a leader in his nation, and I don't think he was living like a leader. So anyways, Er's next eldest unmarried brother, Onan, was required to enter a Levitical marriage with Tamar. So we have a Levitical marriage, which we talked about when we were looking at the book of Ruth. And so those who want to go back and look at that sermon series, it's great to dig into that, kind of figure out what a Levit Levitical marriage looks like. But basically it says that if a brother dies, his next brother marries his wife, and the seed that they produce is a seed of inheritance and takes over his brother's inheritance and carries that on. So you can see that in Deuteronomy 25, 5 to 10. But Onan refused to have a child with Tamar, knowing the offspring would be the heir to his brother's estate and not his own. So the Lord punished him. This is a powerful thing, right? Because usually the Levitical marriage is seen as, as, a, as an option or a choice. And that's kind of how we looked at it in Ruth. It was like Ruth had a choice in it. Boaz had a choice in it. The nearest relative had a choice in it. Here it doesn't look like there was a choice. And so what does that mean? What does that mean? Well, what I believe that means is if God is calling you, or if you are part of God's plan, you might want to reconsider your options. And so as we're sitting there in our, in our life, and we're looking at the things that are going on around us, and we're praying, and we're seeking God's will, that's what I think that Onan refused because he wasn't seeking God's ultimate will. So it's important to realize that although God gives us this choice in life, he's very committed to our choices lining up with his plan. And so he corrects, he instructs. <clears throat> in this instance, he removed. Will God remove people? It's kind of a harsh kind of thing to think about. Will God remove people? Well, we know he removed Onan. And so if God is calling you to fulfill his mission right now today in life, because I believe we're all called with a purpose, he will remove you out of the way to fulfill his mission. And so if things are not going as well, and I'm not talking about just living in COVID season. I'm talking if you find yourself struggling for the last three or four years spiritually and you can't figure out why, Maybe we ought to have a conversation privately because I'd love to talk to you about what your day looks like, what your actions look like, what you're doing in your life. And so Genesis 3, 38, 8 through 10 kind of looks at this death. All right, now we're going to another son. Judah's third son, Shelah, was not yet old enough to marry, so Judah told Tamar to return to her father's house and wait for Shelah to grow up. When Shelah came of age, Judah failed to keep his promise. And there's another sign of him being kind of corrupt, failing to keep his promise. Anybody have anybody in their life who fails to keep promises? Do we like to be around those kind of people? I think that's one of the worst character attributes you can have, is to be a person who fails to keep their word. And so what is our word worth? What are our promises worth? Well, when Shlaw came of age, Judah failed to keep his promise, and Tamar took matters into her own hands. And so the question here is, is, how many things in our life are we taking into our own hands? I was thinking about this, and this, is what, this message was really for me this week. And I think this slide right here was the one that was for me, more than anything, because I have a tendency to take things into my own hands. And I do. I'm like, I can make that happen. I can pull this off. We can figure out how to have 45 different services with 20 people in each service, Right? We can start taking matters into our own hands. Oh, I can handle that problem. Oh, I, can, I can help this person. And you know what? A lot of times in my life, the Lord has blessed me to actually be able to handle things on my own res with my own resources. But I think this slide was a reminder to me to d this week that maybe we don't always want to rely on our own resources, but we always want to rely on him, the author and perfecter of our faith, because he is the one that ultimately resources us. He's the one that powers and equips us to do the things that we need to do. And so Tamar is taking matters into her own hands. And what's crazy about this story is, is, is that through this process, God still blesses them. And that's what blows my mind, is that in all this corruption and all this deceit, God is still blessing his seed and his promise. And so one of the things that 
the Lord really laid on my heart is, is he is, the Lord is really committed to keeping his promises. And so, has he made promises to you? Kind of an interesting thought. Has the Lord made a promise to you? He's made a bunch to me. Tons of them. I like to talk about that. Hundreds of promises the Lord's made to me. And he's made promises to you. And if you're not aware of that, maybe you ought to pick up your Bible and start reading it. Because it's full of God's promises to us. You know, he promised to never leave me or forsake me. And I hold on to that one very dear in my life. He promised that we'll be part of a great nation. And I hold on to that one very dear in my life. So that when I'm looking at the world around me and I feel like it's coming to an end, it's not coming to an end. The question I have for, for everybody around us is, is since you know, January or February, whenever March, whenever this season hit, are we still sharing our faith? I have a guy on my Thursday night men's group that came to faith at Easter this year. And he's been on stinking fire for the Lord. And he watched a video, a sermon presentation, an Easter service online, and came to faith. And he's probably the most fired up guy right now that I know for the Lord. And so just because we're meeting on video or because we're meeting in small groups, it doesn't limit the Lord in any way, shape, or form for the power he has in our lives. And so we want to remember that in all we do. So to Tamar devised a plan to enter Judah, to entice, sorry, to entice Judah into having relationships with her, and then produce, produced an heir. She covered her face and disguised as a prostitute. So here we are, we have Judah, right, leader of the 12, one of the 12 tribes of Israel, off seeking a prostitute. Yeah, not really a good, not really a good part of our history there. So, and her plan worked. Tamar became pregnant with the twin boys, and as a result of her encounter with Judah, when the time came to give birth, Zariah's hand emerged from the womb first, so that the midwife tagged the child's first with a red thread to identify him as the firstborn. But then Zariah pulled his hand back, and suddenly Perez burst forth from Tamar's womb, earning his name and the rights of the firstborn. Now, this red thread is such an important theme that goes through all the scripture. We're going to talk about that a little bit, but before we get into that, they're still trying to do their own plan here because the red thread has to do with the firstborn, not the first handout. So why were they putting that little red thread on? They were trying to make their own plan again, trying to make their own plan. Oftentimes in in Jewish culture, when, when twins come, so that people don't forget a week or two down the line, there's a red thread that's put on the firstborn. And I always think to myself, well, this is really interesting because we're going to see. We're going to see who carries on the line of God because it's not always the firstborn. We saw that in, in the story of Noah. It's not always the firstborn. And so this culture of Jewish people that had this hierarchy or this honor that went to the firstborn doesn't always work that way, does it? So what it works, uh, work, the way it works is that honor and glory goes to the one who honors and glories God. And that's what we really need to remember. Honor and glory goes to the one who honors and glories God. All right, theologians, they refer to the scarlet thread running through the Bible. The Bible is the theme of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice for the redemption of mankind. We see this in the Garden of Eden. Okay. We see it in Isaac, when the ram took his place, which is a real powerful last-minute bailing out by God. If you really want to see a cool thing, and most of us don't get this, is if you read the tabernacle and how it's designed, which is an intense part of Scripture and takes you time to get through. But if you can read it, the scarlet thread comes over and over and over and over all the way through. And then ultimately, this scarlet thread takes us up to John the Baptist's de declaration, right? We see that from Passover to the Lamb of God who will take away, and it's the red thread, and ultimately Jesus dying at the foot of the cross. But the scarlet red thread, we should all have 
our favorite story in there. We should all look at that thread, and, and, and it's a really good way to keep an idea of what's going on. And so as we have that as part of our favorite story of the lineage of God, one of mine is in the book of Romans, where the scarlet thread, thread comes up again with Phoebe, who's a scarlet. She's a own mighty, powerful businesswoman, owns a scarlet trade business. And uh, if you look at Romans 16, which is just kind of a side note for you guys, go study it. But Paul the Apostle is commending her okay, because she started the church in Rome. She brought the letter in with her scarlet trade business. She started the church in Rome. She was the head of these 32 churches in Rome. And that's kind of really countercultural to our culture, right? Yeah, even our Christian culture. But she was a very wealthy woman, and uh, God used her in a mighty way. Because once again, God uses who he chooses to use, not who we choose to say. And so this scarlet thread goes all the way through Scripture. Um, these 32 churches in Rome ended up taking the message to the whole world. It was all started by one faithful woman. That's what I believe. Who, who was in, I believe she was in the upper room, listening to, in Jerusalem, listening to the message. And so those, those who say that God doesn't use women in a mighty way should probably come talk to me because I think throughout Scripture, God uses more women in a mighty way than he uses men in a mighty way. We have some key Scripture verses that talk about that all the way through. The book of Matthew opens up looking at two women. The book of Ruth opens up looking at a woman. And so we just have this powerful message, and I think that's important. Um, it's important for me to always talk about that. You always hear me talk about that, because what I want for my boys is them to wear, marry a mighty, powerful, godly woman someday. And I can't preach that if I don't believe there are those. And so, anyways, that was a real side note. But. So, both Tamar and Judah sinned in the moral union. God worked through their sinfulness to bring about the birth of Christ through their bloodline. So if anybody ever wants to know Romans 8.28, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. How does that work? This is how I think that works. And we know that all things work together for good to them who love God. So I love God. Me, this is about me. I love God. This is about you if you love the Lord. And how did he work things all together for good? Wow. Uh, he brought about Perez in this relationship so that as we look down generations and generations, we could get to where I still can be here and I can still have a faith. This doesn't get applied to our lives like, well, I can do whatever I want. God's going to work good out in that. Because what ends up happening to Judah and Tamar is not good. Not good at all. For all of us who look back at that, we realize that she took matters into her own hands, and that was not good. And so they lost their testimony. What does it mean to lose your testimony? Well, it can happen all kinds of different ways, and it can happen subtly in our lives. It's more of this monkey see, monkey do, how do you live? So I haven't had a drink for 20 years. And I can stand up in front of you guys on the pulpit and say that. I haven't had a drink for 20 years. And that's powerful because I struggled with that in my life. But I can ruin that today. I can go have a, a drink and ruin my testimony. And so we don't want to ruin our testimony. Check how you're living. Check what God is doing in your life right now. Because there is an enemy, and he does want to ruin your testimony. He wants to knock us down. Um, he wants to knock us down. He wants to take us out of the game. So God worked through their sinfulness to bring about the birth of Christ through his bloodline. So let's look at this respected family of Perez, because that's one of the things I think is so important for us to look at. He became the, the ancestral leader of the Perizzite clan, which is kind of an interesting name, you know, Perizzites, Perizzites, kind of close. But he was made fun of that clan. Maybe, maybe not, I don't know. But you can check them out in Genesis 46 and 12 and Numbers 26, 20. But here's one of my favorite scenes. When the Israelites returned from captivity in Babylon, so they've been in captivity from Babylon. This is kind of the book of Daniel that you guys are in, and it's really a powerful book. 468 parasites were chosen to live in Jerusalem out of this group. And you can read about this in 1 Chronicles 9, 4, and Nehemiah 11, 4, and 6. But the Bible says they were all, all 
468 of them are all outstanding men. And so what does that look like? Well, for us raising men, that gives us hope that all of our men can become outstanding men. But it also gives us hope as a church that we can all be outstanding representations of God. But think about it. How did these men end up being outstanding men? I think it has a lot to do with that monkey see, monkey do. They were watching. And who were they watching? I think they were watching guys like Daniel, standing up, looking different. Right? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were watching these guys. They were watching these examples. They weren't all in the fire, but they were watching it, and they were hearing these stories. And so what does it mean to us to live the example out for the next generation? What does it mean for us to live it out? To really live it out, not work it out. Trello was sharing with us today that we need to rest. Right? That rest sometimes is living it out. We don't always just need to work. All right, let's look at another example of this family because it's a powerful family line. All the people were in Ruth now, and this is the part that when we were doing the Ruth series, this is the slide that I promised we would get to eventually that would show us the power of the line of David. And all the people were in the court, and the elders said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, both of whom built their house of Israel. And may you achieve wealth in Ephrathah and become famous in Bethlehem. Moreover, may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah, through the offspring which the Lord will give you by this young woman. And so, how can our house be like the house of Perez? Well, we all have a bad past. That's one way we can start there. Regardless of who you are, we all look back and we go, wow, there's some things I'd really like to change. And we can also all look forward and go, that's where I need to be different. I need to use my hurts from the past to help those that are hurting today. And so, does our past impact us? Or does it defeat us? And so the enemy wants to use our past to defeat us. But today I'm encouraging you guys to use your, fa- your past as um, something to strengthen you, something to equip you, something to encourage you, something to help you strive forward. When I look at my past, I get excited because I know after all that I have been through, the Lord Jesus Christ still chooses to love me regardless. And not only that, he chooses to use me which just blows your mind, because I look at Aaron Branner, and I don't think I'd use that guy. I think we all look at ourselves some days and think, wow, man, why is the Lord using me? And I think that's the worst thought we can think, because if we start thinking, why is the Lord using me? We start thinking right after that, well, maybe he doesn't love me. Maybe he doesn't want to use me. And here's the deal. If you're alive, and you're breathing, and you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior... It's because he still has a plan for you. So figure out what that plan is. The family line of Perez was well respected, evidenced by the blessing pronounced at the wedding of Boaz and Ruth. So this blessing was pronounced at you know, the wedding, and there was a whole culture at this point. Because this is ending up, the book of Ruth ends up at the time of Judges. So we're at about a thousand years in now and uh, to, to the Bible. And it's kind of thousand years back, sorry, thousand years back, before Christ, and uh, it's a real powerful time. It's a real powerful time. The time of Judges is a thousand year period of time, and so we have to keep in mind that after a thousand years of being reigned by these judges when things weren't working, there was still a group of people that recognized a righteous family. Because we always look at the time of Judges and we think, and it's just a bunch of messed up people. And it's a, a lost time. Well, Ruth is in the middle of that. The Moabites are in the middle of that. And God is still redeeming people out of that. All right, so here it is. The line of David begins here, which if you've been tracking through Ruth, we ended Ruth intentionally short 
so that we could talk about it here because I know I don't like to preach on the same thing over and over and over again, especially within a, a season. So here it is. We have a respected family nine. Now these are the generations of Perez. To Perez was born Hazaran, and to Hazaran was born Ram, and to Ram Amidad Nadab, and to Amidadab was born Nishan, and to Nishan Solomon, and to Solomon was born Boaz, and to Boaz Obedid. Obed, and to Obed was born Jesse, and to Jesse, David. King David. And so here we have this line. And when we look at a lot of these characters in this line, um, and we're going to keep looking at a couple of these. Next week we're going to look at one of them, Boaz's father. Anybody ever figured out why Boaz was so awesome? I think he watched his father being awesome. Monkey see, monkey do. There we get it again. And so we see this, that he knew the law, he knew the, the statutes. We knew all of Lot, what was going on. And so we're going to look at that. Solomon next week is our key character that we're going to be looking at. And it's going to be, we're going to be talking a lot about how do we live our lives out? How do we live our lives out? And believe me, it's more important than any one moment. More important than any one moment and more important than any one thing you're doing. It's are your children seeing a person who loves the Lord? Do they see somebody who loves the Lord? Do the people around you, if you don't have children yet, do the people around you see somebody who loves the Lord? What does that look like? When you're at work, and you stop and you go to eat, do you pray? Do you pray for your food? I don't know, you don't have to. Some, I know a guy who just wakes up in the morning and prays for his whole day because he's going to get busy and forget to pray. And some of us need that, you know? But the important thing is, is do people around you seeing somewhere, living your, your walk out, do they see that? You know, you're walking along and something comes out of your mouth that shouldn't have come out of your mouth. You go, wow, I shouldn't talk like that. Sorry. Do people say that? I work on that. Because we're not perfect, are we? None of us. But the difference between what I believe a Christian lives like and the rest of the world is that with the power of God in us, we can live different. So if I'm, not, if I'm non-Christian and I go and do something to my brother or my friend that, that offends them, well, that's one thing. I'm just like everybody else in the world. But as a Christian... I'm going to do something that offends somebody. At some point, I'll probably upset everybody. But the difference is, is this, because I'm not perfect. The difference is this. As a Christian, I need to go back to that person. And I need to say, man, I was having a rough day. I wasn't thinking, will you forgive me? Will you forgive me? That isn't what I wanted to be like. That isn't how I want to live. Can you forgive me for my actions? And so as we're looking at what we want to live like, Perez is leaving a testimony for generations, and I believe it's because of how he acted and lived. We're still in that respectable family. So Perez was the one who was to carry the line of Judah. The tribe of Judah is the only tribe that has kept their heritage. So when you're looking at the 12 tribes and you figure out what's going on with our world around us, well, there was a plan God had. And that plan that was only one of these tribes was going to keep their heritage. And this seed was going to come from one of these tribes. And it's important for us to remember that, that God's plan was not about a nation. It was about redeeming the individual, right? It was about a Savior coming to redeem the individual, our Lord Jesus Christ, who was going to come and save us from certain death. I had somebody come up to me the other day and they said, you must feel so fortunate to be out of a Jewish home. And that, that always gets me struggling inside. You can see that, right? Because here's the deal. The Jewish people, and I think I need to say this more often, they are not God's chosen people. The church is God's chosen people. Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay the penalty for all of humanity. And God has made promises to the Jewish nation, and he'll fulfill those, because they were really important to God. You shall be my people. But then God added to that, 
who will be his people. And so we have this nation that, yeah, they are God's people, and God loves them, and God's going to keep their promises, right, to him. And they got another seven years coming, okay? But not because of them, but because of God, and a God who keeps his promises, always keeps his promises. And into that fold, he's added the church. And he always keeps his promises. So in John 3, 16, when Jesus Christ died on the cross for God so loved the world that he sent his only son, then we all became his people. Jew, Gentile, and anything else you think in between. And it's important that we remember that. We remember that. Because oftentimes people go, well, wow, they were so special. Or Aaron, you have such a special heritage. And I'm like, well, if you have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have a special heritage. And my Christian heritage that I'm leaving for my kids, hopefully, monkey see, monkey do, so I hope you guys see your dad living it out, right? Would I want them to grow up in a Jewish home, or would I want them to grow up in a Christian home? <laughs> I'd want them to grow up in a Christian home. I want them to hear the message of Christ being proclaimed. So we're going to end up with a final thought here, looking at Revelation 5, which is why I just love that. We don't plan this worship out. And, uh, but it ends up, the Lord plans it out every week, and I just love how he does that. And so we're in Revelation 5.5, 5, and the elders said to me, Stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seals. And so I thought I'd look up this work, word here. And I always put up things so small because it's a bad habit I have. And so someday maybe I'll just make copies of my slides for everybody that wants it. But when you see a lot of sermon presentations, people put up one, two, three things. I know, I'm guilty. I'm stuffing as much as I can into each slide. And it probably makes people crazy. But my hope is that when I put this video on tomorrow, right, that's what I'm really doing. Because what I know is this. During a sermon message, people catch about 25% of what I'm talking about, no matter how I do my slides, 25%. And so really, I produce my slides for when I put the sermon online, which I'm going to do every Monday for you so that you guys can go by and when, back and watch it. When it's online, I'm hoping you make a note here on line of the tribe of Judah, that there's something you want to look at. And so really what I'm trying to do is encourage you guys to dig into the Word of God throughout the week. Because that's the important part. If church is just on Sunday, folks, we're in big trouble. We are in big trouble. The church needs to be every day. It needs to be every day. And so we're looking at this word, nikau, which is to overcome. And I was reading through it. It occurs 28 times. Most of these times it actually occurs in the book of Revelation, which is really a cool thing. I mean, 24 times it stands for conqueror. Isn't the Lord our conqueror? Twice it stands for prevail. And once, get the victory. To get the victory. And once to conquer. Right? And I thought, man, this is great. But then it went on. To carry off the victory. Come off victorious of Christ, victorious over all of his foes. So that's Christ. He's victorious of all of his foes. Of Christians that hold fast their faith even unto death against the power of their foes and temptations and persecutions. When one is arraigned or goes to law to win the case, to maintain one's cause. And so are you conquerors in Christ today? That's what we need to ask ourselves. And this, this scene in Revelation 5 is a powerful scene. And uh, the Lord put it on my heart this week. Usually I do some 20-some slides. And the Lord put it on my heart. I think I was talking about that with you a little bit. Put it on my heart this week to just keep it down to 15. And I think this is why. I really believe it because I prayed on that long and hard with him. I think the real reason why is because he wants us to look at this scene in Revelation chapter 5 and realize that there's a book of life that he opens. And every name that is in that book of life, he is the one that has the authority to open it. And as we're walking along through life, we can get debating so many things as Christians, right? Well, is it free will or is it predestination? 
Is it the rapture? When does it happen? Is Jesus man or God? And so many times I started thinking to myself, you know what really matters? What really matters is that your name is in this book of life. And it's more important than any other thing that matters. Because these are the people that God has given to his son. And so it doesn't even necessarily matter how you think the whole process of how you come into the book of life happens. Because I actually think that God pursues people. And I've had other people say that, well, God just undoes his blindness for everybody and reveals himself to everybody. And I say, yeah, that too. Because God works in so many infinite ways to bring people to faith, sometimes he just shows up in a dream. Sometimes he shows up in a warehouse like he did for me. Sometimes he uses us. And so as you start looking at the patterns and the models and things, I'm like, I don't know what to tell you. But what I do know is this. We have this God who shows up, who shows up and wants to be in the center of your life. What I do know is what the blood of Christ pays the price for. And that's something that we all need to agree on regardless. And so our sins separate us from God. If you don't know what that means, that sin word, because we live in a culture that really easily has just distorted that word so bad. One of my favorite looks at it is this term in archery, because I kind of love to go play with my bow. So there's a point in archery that you're trying to hit. You're trying to hit this point in archery wherever your target is, the bullseye. And anything that's off that bullseye is called sin. Well, for us, the world we live in, that sin is what God desires. We don't always think about that. We're like, oh, sin is when you know, I'm drinking or I'm smoking. or I'm, so We start making our lists. Well, really what sin is is anything off the mark of what God is desiring in your life, right? He is holy. And so anything off the mark of God is sin. And our sins have separated us from God. And Jesus Christ died on the cross to repair that, to repair that relationship. Why? Because he's awesome. Because he loves us. Because he's all in. If you think about that, Right? What does it mean to be all in? Well, it means to step out of heaven into humanity. Reveal yourself to all of humanity while you're taking it for the team. Big time. The world did not like him. He was offensive to many people. Those who followed him loved him, but he was offensive. And then he died on the cross. And one of these times we'll spend some time looking at the things that that happened when he died on the cross. But some of the things that, you know, seven things that Jesus said when he died on the cross, just blow your mind. Because even after all that everybody had been through with him, they didn't understand. They didn't understand. You think that when he was up there dying, all the hell of his disciples would have this boldness. But that didn't happen. They all ran off and fleed. It wasn't until later in the book of Acts when we see the Holy Spirit come upon them that they get a boldness. So our sins separate us from God. And the free gift is of eternal life with God is Jesus Christ's blood. And so here's the deal. What does that gift mean to you? Have you grabbed it and accepted that? Have you recognized that Jesus died on the cross for you? That's the first step. Just the first. Okay. I wonder if in the book of life there's little notes there next to each guy's name. That's what I wonder, because we don't know much about that book. We just know our names are in it. I don't know if there's a note. Well, Aaron's pretty good, except when he gets a little excited, then he forgets what he's doing. But we're going to love him anyways. You know what I mean? I wonder if there's little notes in there about each one of us. Man, watch out for that Aaron guy. He's on fire for the Lord. What are the notes? What are the notes about your life? Wow, you know, Aaron goes home at night and doesn't always spend time with his family like he should. There are notes like that, too. Are there things that we can work on? Have you put up an inventory of your Christian walk? 
to see how it's going, well, I encourage you to write that inventory. I encourage you to do that. But what we know is, is this book of life is opened up by the king of the tribe of Judah. And he died on the cross to redeem his tribe. And it's so important that we remember that. So we don't become part of God's people because we have a Jewish lineage. And we don't come part of God's people by anything other than the blood of Christ. And we need to keep that in mind, especially as we're going into these tough times that we're in right now. Because I think they're going to get a little bit more interesting over the next couple months. And so here's my challenge to you guys today. When you're on your social media, or you're on Facebook, or you're on whatever you're on, okay, I want you to think two thoughts. The first thought is this. As you're scrolling down and you see a name of a person, what does that person stand for? Do they stand for not wearing a mask, or do they stand for wearing a mask? Do they stand for a political side of the coin? What do they stand for? Do they stand for a million and one baking shows, cooking shows? Do they stand for, I've got guys on my motorcycle group, they seem to really stand for their motorcycles. Right? What do they stand for? And then the next thing I want you guys to think about is, is when people are scrolling through your name list, what do you stand for? And here's my deal. I want when people scroll through my name, I want to see message after message after message talking about Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And so be careful of the testimony we're sharing with the world right now. Because the reality is, is this. Through everything I've been in my life, 48 years old, some of the stances I took looking at the world around me, okay, they were right. Some of the stances I took looking at the world around me were not right. They weren't. I look back and go, <laughs> okay, that didn't happen. You know, and that's just normal. Half the world thought that at the year 2000, we were just going to, every computer was going to blow up. I used to think, oh, well, that'll be good for the baking industry because I'll be making a lot of bread, right? I don't know. But we all have our thoughts that just, they may or may not happen. But there's one thought that I've never been wrong about, and that's who Jesus Christ is. And why is that? That's because. He's never wrong. He is truth. Truth entering the world. And so as I sit back and I think about my, my representation of the world around me, I want to make sure that I'm representing Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And so I encourage you guys to do that too. It's part of our testimony. What does your testimony look like going back? And so through this real tough season we're in, um, keep in mind that, like we talked about last week, we are ambassadors for Christ. We represent him. We're not from here. This world around us shouldn't make sense. Your worldview, if you have a healthy Christian worldview, the world you're in should not make sense. If the world you're in doesn't make sense, you should thank God on your knees for that because he's given you a Christian worldview. And why would a Christian worldview match up with a secular worldview? It's just not gonna. It's just not gonna. So let's pray. Father God, we uh, thank you that you are our King of kings, Lord of lords, Savior of the world who came to take away the sin of the world. And so, Father, we, uh, we recognize you as the one who reigns as the King of the tribe of Judah, who sits on the throne. So, Father God, uh, we thank you so much for our names being in the book of life. Thank you for that. Lord, we thank you that you would go through such an extensive process to reach each and every one of us, Lord. And we pray for those who don't know you today, those in my family, those in my community, those who are struggling, those that don't find hope in anything, Lord. And help us all to understand that our ultimate hope is found in you as our king. Yes. yes. And so, Lord, today we want to rely on your promises. We want to rely on your word. And so, Lord, encourage us, equip us, mm -hmm. and strengthen us yes. to reach the world for you. And, Lord, yes. help us be a fragrant aroma for you mm -hmm. in all that we do. And yes. we just pray that in Jesus' mighty name. They all said? Amen. Amen.